thank you for having me. If I mess this up, you know who to blame. As, uh, as humans, we are prone to mess things up. Uh, we've been doing so for a long, long time. And uh, boys and girls especially, I address this to you. And I'm very sad to say we've messed things up very badly here on Earth. So, do we have to move to Mars? Before I answer this, let's focus on things back down here on Earth and see what we've been up to. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, and partly due to its 71% water and due to its atmosphere, it's been hospitable to so many forms of life, including us humans. Now, whether you believe that we first emerged as Homo sapiens two to 300,000 years ago, or you believe that we're descendant from Adam and Eve many, many thousand years after that, the fact of the matter is, as humans, we reproduced. And we did so a lot. Um, it took us 200,000 years to get to one billion people in 1804. And it took us just over 200 years to reach 7.6 billion people today. Just over 200 years. 7.6 billion people live on Earth today, and about 100 billion people have died before us. I was born here in Dubai in 1976. I checked today the population of Earth back then in 1976. It was 4.1 billion. We've had an 83% increase in population just in the time that I'm alive. And to put things in perspective of what this all meant, this is a chart that some people have come up with to show all forms of life on Earth. It's measured in gigatons of carbon. So it includes plants, it includes bacteria, fungi, animals, you name it. This is where we are, humans. In that small triangle over there in the corner, if you expand it, humans form just above 0.01% of all life on Earth. 0.01% of all life on Earth. But due to our ability to communicate, due to our ability to cooperate, our ability, our resourcefulness, our ambition, we have been able to spread and conquer all other forms of life on this Earth. So the 0.01% have conquered this globe. We've also concocted over many years this chain, known, the, known as the linear materials economy. If I take you through it, it basically meant that we've extracted stuff from the earth, we've cut down trees to make things that we thought we needed. We use those things to make other things that we thought other people needed. And we've consumed and produced and consumed and produced so much that in fact, we've produced a lot, we've consumed a lot, but as a result of this whole chain, we've wasted a lot, lot more than what we've consumed. To expand this chain, we've used energy. And this energy brought from that biomass that was buried millions and millions of years ago, made this whole chain possible and made the industrial revolution possible and made so much more production possible and so much more waste possible. The result, we start with waste. Two billion tons of municipal solid waste. Municipal solid waste is basically garbage. Two billion tons annually is wasted. That's the equivalent of one, approximately one million cars. One third of all food produced is thrown away or is spoiled or is wasted in some way. One third of all food. In the US alone, 90% of all material extracted to make things or use things goes to waste, 90%. And only about 20% generally, globally, 
is recycled or composted. Where does the rest go? So first things, it goes here to landfills, these beautiful things that we have around major cities around the world. Some of it goes to incineration. We burn it for using energy. We say in Arabic, nus musibah. So it's half a problem. And the rest, you've all seen these. So what other nastiness have we been up to? We have depleted our resources. We've cut down our trees. 30% of our land used to be forest. 20% of all the oxygen we've ever breathed used to come from the Amazon. And we're doing this so fast at the moment that approximately one and a half acres disappears every second. 20 football fields worth of forest disappears every minute. And if we keep going at this pace, in 100 years, we will have no forest left. What other pleasantries have we been up to? We've all but finished the water. So you can see the pictures are similar here. These crops were not cut. These crops have simply died. We finished the water. If you think about it, although 71% of Earth is water, just 2.5% of it is fresh water. Water demand globally is, was expected to increase from 2000 to 2050 by 65%. We simply don't have it. At the moment, 21 out of the major 37 aquifers are being depleted. They're not getting replenished by rain and, and so on as they are being used. What does this mean? You guys remember South Africa two years ago, Cape Town? California? Six, seven years they've had this? Scientists have predicted that the wet places on Earth are getting wetter and the dry places on Earth are getting drier, which means, simply speaking, that when the people living in the dry places end up running out of water, there's only one place they can look at, is the place where it's getting wetter and we're likely to run into problems then. These two places, by the way, it's interesting. Cape Town and California sit next to some of the world's largest oceans, and yet they are running out of water. One final gift we've left for people, something called global warming. You've seen this? Since 1880, the globe has warmed only by about 0 0.8 degrees. That's nothing. 0 0.8 degrees from 1880 until now. Two degrees centigrade, which is expected to be reached by 2030, will cause this. Rising seas, severe storms, extreme heat, drought, forest fires. We've all seen the forest fires, the disastrous forest fires that have happened in California this year. We have 12 to 15 years to salvage things on Earth. 12 to 15 years, because if we don't do so, we reach what scientists call the point of no return, after which the damage that's done is irreversible. Let's see what happens if 3 degrees C is reached by 2100. Then it's basically Armageddon. There is, scientists cannot even predict what will happen, but if we are ever to concoct ourselves a doomsday, which is self-inflicted, it's this. So. What do we do? Boys and girls, we've messed this thing up for you, and now it's up to you to fix it. <laughs> right? We're not going to do it. We're going to die soon. So solution, my solution is we move to Mars. All right? Let's go there. Easy. It's, uh, it's the closest planet to Earth. It's the closest atmosphere that is there to Earth, it's a little bit cooler. And yes, we don't have any technology to take us there now, we need to move millions of people, but we'll come up with it. Some people, in fact, have thought about how to make Mars more hospitable to human life. They thought about something called terraforming. 
And to do terraforming, it means that we need to warm Mars's atmosphere up. How do we do that? We need to release carbon dioxide into the Martian atmosphere. Sound familiar? Elon Musk, in fact, thought to expedite this, we need to send nuclear bombs to Mars to release carbon dioxide into the Martian atmosphere. So I'll be looking forward to that. All right. This is how much preparation I've been doing. So does this mean that I think it's a bad idea to explore the possibility of moving to Mars? Absolutely not. I think it's a good idea. I think science needs it. I think we have it in our DNA to uh, explore. Uh, I think we'll find so many new materials that we can use back here on Earth. I think it's an it's a absolutely necessary thing. However, I also think we're spending billions and billions of dollars of resource on this expedition that is diverting the attention away from what we're doing back here on Earth. And I think what we need to do is come back down to Earth and to focus on fixing things down here. So what can we do? First, you remember that open loop system that, you, that I showed you? Starts with cutting down the trees and taking things from the Earth and then wasting it in the dump. This is a closed loop system. What it means is you extract less things because you use the things that you've already used before. And you consume less. So we need to be a little bit wiser. We end up producing less per capita because we're not producing as many things that we're dumping. And we will use, therefore, less energy. We will use less water. We will cut less trees. And we will produce less waste. So this is the first thing. So we have to be a little bit careful about what we consume, whether it's plastic bags or, as Mimi is very fond of, straws, using less straws. All those things really, really matter. Next thing, the food we eat. This is uh, an example of, uh, in fact, one of the things being developed by Emirates Airlines here is uh, vertical farming. This is an example of how the, the, the old major use of land on this earth for agriculture can be actually made much more efficient by using this vertical farming, use much less water, use much less space, more sustainable agriculture. Second, we can go on vegan diets, right? You know, diets that are much healthier for us, or we just consume less meats, or we start to develop more meat alternatives. Less water, less CO2 in the atmosphere. Cattle is responsible for the major part of the depletion of the, of the ozone layer. Cattle produces methane, and methane gases basically go and destroy the atmosphere as we know it. So what else can we do? Renewable energy, my passion. So I came into this business by accident um, uh, about five or six years ago. And honestly, I didn't consider myself what people would now call sort of a tree hugger. You know, I came into this business from a, just to look at it from a business perspective. But the more and more I looked into it, the more and more I realized that we're really, I mean, crazy not to be investing more into renewable energy. Look at these stats. Currently, one third of all energy produced globally comes from renewable sources. One third. This is non-nuclear. This does not include nuclear. One third of all energy. Iceland, for example, one of the leading countries in this space, 100% of its energy comes from nuclear sources. It is possible to do. The US, one of the leading countries, one of the leading developed uh, economies, produces only 18%. So we see there, there's a slight imbalance. If we consider the sun alone, that's the business I am in, the solar business, as Abdullah mentioned. 430 quintillion joules, joule hours, sorry, that's 18 zeros, hits the Earth's surface every hour. And humans consume 410 quintillion joules in a year. So we've got multiple thousands more energy hitting the Earth's surface every hour than we consume in the whole year. This is solar energy alone. Solar energy today is 300 times cheaper over the last 40 years than it was. And in the, in the time that I was looking at solar energy, it's become about 
80% cheaper. Electricity today that's produced using solar energy is cheaper than electricity using other means like fossil fuels by a large margin. It makes no sense that we continue to dig up the ground and take out dead animals and plants and burn them to produce our energy needs. So, should we go to Mars or should we try to fix things here back on Earth? Unfortunately, some other thing I found out when I was looking at this presentation is that actually even if we wanted to, we cannot go to Mars.